Okay, so this month we are looking at how to add a REST API to a, a existing code with a Corvisoft's RESTBED library. Now, I say existing code, but I've created, you know, just kind of a hacked up example for the purpose of this presentation. But I did a full CRUD style application uh, endpo a rest API endpoints so crud is create read update delete right these are the four database operations that you need to do on uh, that, that you need to have a complete database application now you don't necessarily need to support all those in order to have a rest API you can have a rest API that just supports reading data and doesn't support modifying data but Doing the uh, all four operations shows how to create resources, modify resources, read resources, and delete resources. So it kind of goes through the whole life cycle of your data. So let's take a look at this library. So it is uh, open source library on GitHub. It is available through VC package, which is how I downloaded it and set it up for use on my machine. Um, now, if we go, you know, we've been looking at these open source libraries, and one of the things we've been interested in is, you know, how well maintained are they? How are they getting updates? You know, is anybody paying attention, or has it been orphaned? So if we look at the GitHub commit history for RESTBED, we see that it's had some recent commits. And uh, prior to that, uh, it had been worked on in fall of 2021. And uh, there's not too many open issues. There's 66. Um, if we sort by recently updated, uh, there's some uh, CMake griping and uh, documentation, um, putting it into the Conan package manager, you know, and this is March and April of this year. So they're getting some participation. That means people are using it. Um, I found a few little shortcomings, which I'll go over as we take a look at this. So, but they were, they were minor. They weren't blocking me from achieving what I wanted to do uh, so they're not serious shortcomings but we'll discuss those so here's their list of features that they uh, support uh, web sockets now if you've done any kind of HTTP application programming you know maybe you had a so-called rich client front end where you have JavaScript code generating XML HTTP requests back to the server that launched the page containing the JavaScript. Remember in web applications cross-site scripting limitations prevent you from issuing uh, XML HTTP requests to sites other than the one that served up the page. This is to uh, prevent malware scripts from injecting themselves and doing strange things to your web page um, there are ways to relax that restriction but that is the default restriction so you send HTTP requests back to the server that generated the web page in the first place and in order to have a web page that is being updated dynamically what you need to do is some sort of polling where you set up an interval timer in the client so that it periodically polls the remote server to get updated information to display on the page. Now that is wasteful uh, polling. As, you know, if it's a long time between interesting events, then it's a trade-off of how frequently do you poll in order to make sure that you see the event in a timely fashion, but you don't want to poll too frequently in order to just waste the time of the server saying, yeah, nothing new has happened. So WebSockets is a communication protocol that uses HTTP to bootstrap itself. So it starts out as an HTTP protocol exchange, and the client and the server 
agree through a handshake to upgrade the connection from an HTTP connection to a WebSocket connection. And then this allows full duplex messaging to take place between the client and the server. Uh, if you're doing a REST API uh, you m and you have information that is of a, you know, a sensitive nature in terms of the timeliness of it and you need to have those updates happen more frequently, then you may want to look at WebSockets as a way to transition into something uh, I, w I hesitate to call it real time, but it, it is more responsive than HTTP. So, for instance, like a chat server, you want to do that over WebSockets and not over plain REST API. Although you can do it over REST API, and people have, but WebSockets are better for that. Um, and then the server sent events and Comet, these are also a ways of uh, getting a in a kind of more full duplex conversation going. Um, it really these days from what I read that y you want to prefer WebSockets over Comet. Um, SSL TLS means that it supports HTTPS. Uh, session management allows you to have the idea of a e each connection associated with a session. So typically you know you have some sort of small amount of uh, data that's stored in the session and the client can fetch that out uh, and keep that associated with each connection so that um, you, you are able to quickly and easily establish a context for the requests and that is if you are interacting with uh, you have a, a client server situation where it's stateful, so you need to uh, reestablish the session on each request in order to identify what the state is for that session. Uh, HTTP pipelining, um, this is so that you can have uh, multiple HTTP requests on a single socket connection uh, without waiting for the corresponding responses. Um, path parameters. Um, if you've done things like in uh, Node.js or other server backend frameworks and you have URIs, universal resource uh, identifiers, so a URL is a, sp is a specific form of a URI, you have URIs that represent uh, the, the resources in the server and those are specified by some kind of path uh, so the path is the portion of the URL after the host and the protocol and the port so the protocol might be HTTP the host would be say localhost and the port would be port 80 and then everything after that is the considered the path portion of the URL up to the hash sign which indicates a, a, a fragment within but everything between the port and the fragment is the path and you can break that path up into um, chunks that represent the, the resource type and then after that following it is like some kind of identifier that identifies a specific resource instance of that type and so you want to break up that full path and recognize those chunks as a, the identifier for instance and, and be able to parse that out and so that's called a path parameter and various web frameworks have ways of matching that and RESTbed is no different and we'll see that when we get to our little example here um, filter HTTP requests by you know headers log um, have full control over all the log information and where it goes which if you're running a server you know that one of the problems of servers is that they're not attached to any sort of user interface so you need to have some kind of logging system set up so that when things go wrong and they will that you can identify you know what was going on at the time of the problem so logging is pretty important for any kind of server scenario it's not so much important for a client side scenario but for a server side scenario which is what we're doing with the rest api that's important um, Multipath resources, um, 
a way to access the same resource via different um, URL paths. Um, custom HTTP methods, honestly, I don't know anybody that's ever wanted to do that or needed to do that, but if you want to, you could. I never looked into the HTTP protocol specification to see what it says about methods that are not defined in the protocol standard, um, but with RESPED you can do that. Uh, compression, um, this is useful if you have large blobs of data either going to the server or coming back from the server you, and it, you know, if it's like JSON, a large blob of JSON, compressing that is going to be uh, a significant win for data traffic. Um, the res you know, the, uh, it can handle different encodings, uh, so UTF-8 or UTF-32, ASCII, etc. Uh, of the bodies of the uh, requests and responses that are going around. The rules engine is a way that gives you uh, flexibility over mapping URLs that represent requests to some handler, which is a piece of code that's going to respond to the request. Um, HTTP H TTPS is kind of uh, similar to SSL TLS. I'm not sure why they have a separate call out for that, but uh, they have the ability to uh, support authentication schemes. In my simple example, I didn't do any authentication, but obviously if you're going to allow this service to be on the open internet and you're going to allow the service to modify resources, then you're going to need to enforce some kind of authentication there. Um, it, and the, the basic means for doing that are, you know, either you use the session to associate uh, the connection with a login. So you have some kind of login form, you know, they capture a password. That's usually for an interactive session. If it's um, a programmatic connection, you usually do something like, you authenticate an application and issue it an API key and the API key is transmitted initially as a way to authenticate the incoming connection and you're going to do that over HTTPS or SS, you know, some kind of secure connection so that the API key is not transmitted in the clear so no middleman that could be listening to your network traffic is going to read the API key etc. Um, error handling obviously you want in a long-running service, you want to have some kind of robust error handling mechanism. Uh, address binding is a feature whereby you can uh, set up the same handler to respond to code, or sorry, to respond to URLs that are issued to multiple IP addresses. So in a high-end server, it will typically have multiple network interfaces so that it can receive traffic from multiple um, network sources. And um, it's redundant to have to keep reconfiguring everything for the, all the different IP addresses. So if you can configure it for multiple IP addresses on the binding side, then that uh, saves you some code and prevents you from, you know, having mismatched uh, assignments. Um, signal handling, that's more kind of a, a, a Unix thing. Uh, they have, um, you know, the support for that so that you can do things like send the server a stop signal to tell it to shut down gracefully as opposed to just killing the process in the middle right so it'll um, receive a stop signal it'll stop accepting new requests it'll finish processing any requests that are pending and then it'll shut down gracefully in windows land this is done uh, with a windows service it, it's done differently but there is a similar kind of shutdown mechanism I didn't see explicit support for windows service handling so that is something that they might um, want to add in the future or if that's something that's important to you the you might want to know that you may have to deal with that yourself they have a generic shutdown mechanism so you could write the windows corresponding windows service code yourself and have that uh, delegate into their shutdown mechanism. Um, so here's a little example. So this is an example server. Uh, they have a single main header that you include uh, 
And if you go and look at what actually happens, it then basically just includes all their other um, headers that make up the various components of the system. But they, you know, all their examples, you just include the rest bed header, and then that uh, includes everything else. Um, you obviously could include those finer grained headers if you found including everything with some kind of compiler bottleneck. So um, let's kind of start go uh, bottom up. So you have a service that represents your HTTP server. Uh, you have resources that are published by the service and uh, the service has started from some settings. The settings represent things like um, the port that's going to be used by the server and um, by setting the default header connection to close it means that the socket connection is closed after every request so that's opposed to a so-called keep alive connection where you open a socket connection to an HTTP server you issue a request to it you get back a response and if the connection was set to keep alive then you without closing and reopening the socket you can issue new HTTP requests to that same server this is typically what a browser does because when you load a, a web page right there's a, there's not just the HTML that represents the web page there's CSS files that are referenced by the web page there's JavaScript files that are referenced by the web page there's image files referenced by the web page and initially in HTTP 1 you had to open a new socket connection for every one of those individual files that were being fetched down to complete the rendering of the web page. With a Keep Alive connection, those requests can all be issued on a single socket, which is important because sockets have this so-called slow start behavior. So initially, when you can, uh, a TCP socket, when it's established, the uh, data rate is kind of throttled intentionally low because uh, it's kind of learning whether or not you've got a fast connection or not. So um, every web browser nowadays doesn't do uh, close on the connection header. It does keep alive uh, so that the socket can kind of ramp up the speed and, and adapt to the fastest reliable transmission rate that it can achieve and that enables all the information you need to fetch from the remote server in a series of requests to happen more efficiently but for their examples they're always doing uh, connection close um, and they've created a resource and the URI path so this is the part of the URL after the host name and the port which is determined by the service settings but the resource is associated with a path and the path here is just slash resource they didn't use any path parameters. We'll see what a path parameter looks like in a little bit. And when you use the post HTTP verb to this URL path, it will invoke this callback to handle that request. And that callback takes the session. And from the session, you can get the request. You can also get the response. Um, it, from the request you can get header fields from the request and the way this works is get header takes the name of the header field and header fields are always case insensitive but just by convention you write them capitalized this way this is the default value for the header field if it is not present and using the type of this um, second argument it does uh, overload resolution to know what the ret that the return type of this header should be int you can also fetch string valued headers or um, other types besides int they could be you know unsigned longs or what have you then um, using this fetch method they're going to fetch the body of the request so in HTTP the different verbs in the standard say whether or not they can have a body attached a get request is does not allow a body but a post request does so they got the 
length of the body by fetching the content length value from the header and then calling fetch this is the number of bytes that they're going to fetch and when that number of bytes is available it will invoke this callback which they've written as a lambda the callback receives the session and this bytes type that just represents a vector of unsigned characters uh, I think it's literally a type def for std vector of uint 8t which is an unsigned 8-bit integer also known as an unsigned character unsigned byte so it's a blob of bytes right we don't want to impose any interpretation on the body that the request received because it could be a binary file you know you're uploading a JPEG or something like that um, so you can't just rely on it being a, a character string that's null terminated it is a blob of unsigned 8-bit ints that has a size and um, a, a, you know a data pointer that points to it so because it's std vector right so uh, data here just retrieves retrieves the pointer to the beginning of the data and this is the, the the size of the body now here they printed it as a, uh, a string and what they did is they use this uh, format specifier that says the first argument represents the size of the string and the second argument is a pointer to the string so even if this string contain even if this data this bytes buffer even if it had null characters in the middle uh, printf would still print the it would continue past those null characters because it's printing um, that many this many characters from the pointer uh, and then the um, close the session with um, OK status code so this is you know if you know HTTP protocol it's response code 200 and this is the body of the response and then you can have a, a bag of header uh, name value pairs that are put in the response header and in this case they put in the content length header with a value of 13 and that's because there's 13 characters in this hello world string right so it's 2 4 5 7 11 oh sorry 7 9 11 13 13 characters in this hello so it's not including the null terminating character so it's just putting the uh, the 13 characters of the visible the printable text into the body of the response now some things to notice here uh, we supplied a lambda for processing the body after we read it from the res from the request and uh, that can be uh, a kind of a, a signal a heads up that some of this stuff may be happening asynchronously on different threads you notice that nothing in here said anything about uh, threading or uh, any kind of uh, you know, thread pools or anything like that. Um, there is facility in RESTbed for handling requests on an incoming thread pool um, and you can configure that the number of threads and so on by the settings that you put on the service when you start. Uh, and we will see that this callback is indeed uh, an asynchronous callback because we're reading bytes off a network socket. If this content length is particularly large, by the time we've received the header of the request, that's enough information for RESTbed to identify which resource handler should be handling the request, but the entire uh, body of the request may not have arrived over the socket yet uh, you know if I'm uploading a 5 megabyte file I'm gonna receive enough information in the header which is gonna be like maybe yeah maybe 1k or less of data arriving first before that 5 megabyte file or whatever size file we're sending and that's enough to uh, delegate to the appropriate resource handler before 
the rest of the body has arrived in order for us to um, fully process the request. So this asynchronous handling is something we have to watch out for whenever there's asynchronous or con uh, concurrent handling concurrency in an application you always have to think about uh, my modifying data structures do I need some kind of exclusive lock we'll, we'll see how we handle that in our little example um, in their uh, documentation folder they have um, four little files here and what I notice is this is kind of standard amongst all the core view soft uh, projects um, they have an API file that describes the uh, API of the classes it's not as near as I can tell it's not generated from Doxygen so I think it's hand maintained so that's kind of um, something to be aware of that the actual document or the actual API may diverge from the documentation because the documentation doesn't appear to be automatically generated so you know it's always that wrinkle between even even doxygen generated documentation can differ from the actual API right because doxygen is generated from comments and comments are not code so even doxygen can diverge but when it's kind of hand maintained uh, it's just even more of a thing to keep an eye on that the, the real API is what's in the code and not necessarily what's in these uh, documentation files now having said that as a caveat except for one uh, method name that was just the wrong it was the wrong method name it looked to me like they copy and pasted it and didn't update the method name um, except for that I didn't see any uh, glaring mismatch between the API and in this documentation and the actual code um, this design file is just um, kind of a high level discussion of their design and you know for instance inside inside here that you know here's a discussion of their session class this is kind of an ASCII diagram form of a UML diagram showing the arity relationships between um, a session so here we have a session we see that a session is one-to-one -one with a request and it's also one-to-one -one with a resource and it has these methods on the session object here's their their kind of signature on the left you know simplified and the return type of the method on the right um, they have a little for people who aren't familiar with UML they have a little blurb here talking about UML so you can understand those little ASCII diagrams um, this standards document just describes kind of their coding standards uh, you know so you know why their code looks like the way it does uh, we'll see what their code looks like in a little bit and so if we go into this API MD is uh, the main documentation for this library now it's just kind of arranged as you know a, a list of these classes so this is kind of more of a reference than a user guide um, and if we look say at session so here's the session object you know so it's a brief description of what the session object does and the various methods in it and then for each method say if you look at fetch that we saw from that initial example so here's the overload that they were using in the example it takes a length this overload takes a length and a function a, a stood function that t and the uh, signature of the function takes a shared pointer to a session and a reference to a, a bytes type and you know so you know brief discussion of the two overloads and the types of the parameters but you know would have been nice inside here for it to say that this this function is executed asynchronously it's kind of implied because it's labeled callback but if you're not used to asynchronous programming 
uh, or not used to network programming where asynchronous operations are more common because of network I.O. being slow relative to the CPU. So you don't want to block waiting for network I.O. You want the CPU to continue to do something useful while it's waiting for I.O. You know, that might be a little bit, uh, this might be a little bit too terse. You know what I mean? It's So it's a it's a reference, not a, a, not a user guide or a programmer guide. But um, it's pretty complete. Um, we saw that they had this bytes thing here. They're telling you explicitly that bytes is just a synonym for std vector of byte, and byte is just a synonym for an unsigned 8-bit integer. So it's really bytes. It's not got any kind of interpretation on it. And that's because they have... See, is it in their string class? See, this is their. These links don't actually go anywhere for string. That's the downside of manually created documentation. So, WebSocket. I don't know if it's in this file or not. Could be that's why the links are dead. Uh, URI. Yeah, I think they've removed string from this. That could be an abstraction that they've uh, eliminated just in favor of, of uh, standard string. So these two links don't go anywhere, but like status code does. It's an, it's an enum of HTTP status codes. Now, again, this is because this is manually written. I mean, this enum, this just takes you over to the CPP reference page that describes what enums are in C++. So that's not, you know, this this isn't so great. It doesn't tell me what the enum values are. It just says they were correspond to the status codes that are outlined in the HTTP RFC. You know, uh, and I don't know about you, I've read a bunch of these standards documents. Um, so presumably there's some kind of enum whose name I don't know because it's not in this documentation, I'd have to drill into the headers to find out. They correspond to each one of these status codes. Um, so, you know, okay for a first pass of documentation, but not the greatest. Could could be better. Uh, and it's more of a reference than a guide. So, how do we orient ourselves for different use cases? Well, they do have. Let's get back here. My browsing history. So inside uh, this documentation, they do have this example folder. And then each one of these markdown files has an example of the particular technique that's being described by the name of the file. So for instance, we mentioned path parameters. Here they describe generically what a path parameter is. And we see that here, when we set the path on a resource object that there's this extra curly brace thing here and if you're familiar with other web frameworks you know that that's a very common way of identifying a path parameter within the path of a resource however again there's no there's no comment here and there's no um, description exactly of what the syntax is for these parameters these path parameters uh, digging through the code what I learned is that this is the name of the parameter followed by a colon and then a regex that's used to match characters from the URI path to the parameter so here in this example They don't, they don't show it here. I mean, I mean here they didn't even supply in their example. They didn't even supply a parameter. So that's all. You know, again, not, not the best, but, um, not the worst either. But because this is dot star as a regex, it can match anything, including empty. You know, in this example, this is empty, right? So slash resource slash 
that's specified as fixed text in the path of this resource and then in this case the name was empty they don't show you know what the response was I mean in this case it would just be hello comma space and then empty string is what the response would be from this execution but I could put anything in here including more slashes and that can be confusing to people because in a path specification usually the slashes indicate separation between parameters not text that is part of a parameter so it's it's a little bit confusing I mean it, it's you know really general um, but it would have been nice I mean I figured it out by looking at the implementation but I shouldn't have to drill that far to figure out like what the syntax is of these path parameters so again just documentation can be a little bit better but that's so true of so many libraries right usually the documentation is the part that they you know nobody wants to spend time on but at least you know it's open source so we can figure it out but it just would have been better if it had been you know maybe if this example had been a little bit better because it didn't even provide a value for the path parameter here and this is kind of you know it's not a particularly instructive example because really the more typical scenario is you have resources that are represented by you know some prefix and then you have an ID and then you use the ID to look it up in a database that, that we'll see that when we look at my example that I've cooked up so they do have uh, these example documentation for these different scenarios however what's uh, another thing that's kind of disappointing like you know if we take a look at the logging example um, so the logger is just an abstract interface that you implement so the in this case the custom logger it overrides all the methods some of them don't do anything uh, me personally I'm not a fan of this style uh, this is redundant in C++ to have an empty argument list represented by just a single void that's redundant that's a Cism and then a, a useless return inside an empty function I'm not a fan of that either but that that's their coding style that's described in their standards um, markdown document uh, the important methods here on this logger interface are the log and the log if and yeah, again not a fan of C style printf var args APIs but that's what their interface is so uh, in this case they're just writing to standard error they're just logging everything to standard error and you configure that on the service before you start it with an uh, instance of your implementation of that logger interface so that's how you would set up logging now what's also kind of disappointing about these little examples is this isn't code I can compile and try out so uh, I had to take all these little markdown files copy them over edit out all this uh, preliminary markdown junk at the front and this uh, trailing markdown stuff at the bottom save it into a source file and except for one uh, example that uh, referenced a function before it had been declared so I just had to forward declare the function fortunately everything built so they they, they at least are keeping these example you know these little example scenario files they're up to date with their API so it even though they're not buildable code in the github repository you know there are just markdown files you know if we look at one of these if we look at the raw you know it's it's marked down at the front with a blob of C++ and then more marked down at the bottom so it's not including that source code for that example scenario into the markdown by slurping in another source file a CPP file it's just in line in the markdown so that was kind of a bummer you know not not too difficult to work around but it, it'd be nice if um, 
these examples were actual executable code. I mean, they have a little markdown. You know, this this is just coming from GitHub, right? In the way it's rendering the markdown, it's giving me a little copy uh, icon that I can use to copy the source code into my clipboard, and then I can paste it into a new source file. But uh, since I already had their repository checked out, I didn't go through this route. But it would be better, I think, if these were example source files in their tree and they would be guaranteed to be uh, stay building as the API changed because continuous integration would build those examples. So ag again, minor complaint. Um, so the things we're interested in for our example are uh, this path parameters scenario. We'll see how I am using that to identify resources for access. And uh, I turned on logging. By default, logging is not happening. It, I mean, there's no logger initial, initially except a, a, a logger that just takes all log messages and discards them. So unless you configure logging, you're not going to see any output from your service or your server. Uh, so I used uh, turned logging on. Um, I didn't need any of the these other things uh, in any significant way. I'm not doing web sockets or I, 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 I didn't do authentication, but I don't think it would be hard to add authentication on top of what I got. So what did I create? Let's take a look at it over here. So my little uh, toy example, I just have a database of comic books. So here's my little structure representing a comic. It has the title of the comic, the issue number, and then basically the credits for the people who worked on the comic. The writer, uh, the penciler, if you're not familiar with comic book production, at first they sketch out all the art in pencil. It's typically done by one artist, and then it's handed off to another artist who goes over it with ink to create the final uh, hard lines that you will see in the printed comic. And because the right, because the penciler and the inker are different artists, you know the the raw pencil drawing can be very different from what ends up as uh, the inked drawing that appears in the final printed product. Um, and that's just you know one of the things that makes comics interesting is that there's two artists collaborating on the final image sometimes the pencil sketch is very detailed and the inker follows it uh, at, with accuracy and sometimes the pencil sketch is um, not so detailed and the inker fills in some of that uh, detail get lends some style to it. it it depends on how those two people work together uh, the letterer is the person that writes you know, it draws the letters of all the dialogue that appears. And the colorist is the person who uh, applies the color to the black and white ink drawing. Um, and so those different uh, credits that go with a comic book. And I'm going to have this uh, magic minus one value here for the issue indicating that if you happen to see the structure an instance of this structure and the issue is minus one then that means that this is like a default constructed uh, comic and doesn't represent an actual thing so I know I'm gonna need to have a way to serialize and deserialize this data structure I'm gonna use JSON as my intermediate uh, serialization format and that's because um, JSON is a uh, well-supported encoding of data structures for use on the web. You can also use XML. You could use some custom encoding because remember the body of an HTTP request or response can be up to you to decide how that is used uh, or what, what the encoding of that body is. The, you know, the fact that it's JSON and that APIs are commonly JSON this is not any kind of requirement. This is just simply uh, 
a kind of de facto standard that people have landed on. Initially, things were encoded in XML, which is a lot more noisy than JSON, but now uh, JSON is more the norm. So I'm using JSON, and um, we're not going to go too much into serialization um, other than you know the fact that I'm using JSON, but I, instead of doing it by hand, I'm using uh, this library called Rapid JSON. So I just have these two uh, free functions. Here, let's uh, collapse that guy. Uh, you know, here's my two JSON function. It takes an instance of the structure, builds a JSON string, and returns that. Let's do the reverse. I take the JSON string, build a rapid JSON document around it, parse the document, parse the string into the document, and then pull out the fields I'm interested in. Um, and that's the entirety of this little comic.cpp. My uh, comicsdb.cpp is the file that has the restbed service running in it. So um, let's take a look briefly at. So I'm using, as I mentioned, VC package. Uh, I used it to get restbed. I, I pulled down open SSL but I just didn't feel there was that much uh, additional to be learned from you know looking at my URLs in HTTP localhost versus HTTPS localhost so although I pulled it down as a dependency I didn't actually use it um, when you when you pull down restbed through VC package by default this way um, so if you say VC package search rest bed, um, by default it pulls down a version that's built without OpenSSL support, and you can optionally get the uh, OpenSSL support for rest bed uh, by specifying that in your uh, manifest. Uh, I, d I just didn't happen to do that. Like I said, I just didn't think it was going to add a lot to just look at. HTTPS versus HTTP URLs and then this rapid JSON library is the library they pulled down for the JSON support okay so here's my uh, main function for my little web server and I basically just delegated everything off into a function in my uh, comics DB namespace that runs the service so I'm gonna load my little comic book database into memory uh, you know realistically you know you'd have that attached to some kind of database or maybe you you know you're loading it from a file me I'm just um, constructing a couple of these objects manually and then sticking them in a, a vector a std vector of those structs that we looked at I have my uh, rest bed service I didn't do any usings of namespaces, so when you see this code here, everything that's qualified with um, restbed double colon is coming from the restbed API, and anything I'm using from the standard library is qualified with uh, standard namespace. So um, if you see anything that's not annotated that way, it means it's uh, in my ComicsDB namespace. So I uh, create a service. Uh, publish all my resources to that service. I'm going to set uh, an instance of my custom logger here so we can get some logging output and then I'll start the service with the settings that I'm going to use. So um, the publish resources part is the, the interesting part. So I have two basic URIs here. I have a URI for accessing an individual element from the database by its ID and here I'm using that um, character class regex notation to say that the ID is one or more digits so it can't be empty and it can't be anything that doesn't have it can't be uh, some element here after the slash that contains you know any character other than digits and then down here, I have a resource without uh, a trailing ID, 
and this is used to be able to create new entries in the database. So in a CRUD application, that's create, read, update, delete. This is my create part. This is my read part. Uh, you can see I wrote a little function called read comic. Uh, this is my update part that delegates to a function called update comic. And this is my delete part. Now, when you create these resources, you associate an HTTP verb with a handler function. And again, the handler function is uh, it's a std function, so you can use lambdas here. And what, what I did was write, just to get this code from being too disgusting, I don't want a long lambda appearing here in my source code. So to make things a little more readable, I created a small little function that takes the session and a reference to the database and then does some error checking and then if, every, if everything was uh, specified without any errors then we go ahead and do whatever the operation was and return the result on the session. In the case of uh, reading a comic we're going to use the ID that came in on the path parameter use that to index the database. Uh, I'll show you here that this type is really, it's just a vector of that comic struct that we saw earlier. So I'm going to um, use that ID to look up the particular instance out of the vector. I'm going to turn that into JSON and now I have the JSON as a string. And then I'm going to uh, and remember, we are following their uh, example of where all the connections are closed after the response is returned. So we're not doing keep live collections, connections rather. So I'm calling a closed method with uh, the OK status. This is the body of the response, which is the JSON of my database entry. And then on the headers, I'm specifying that the content type is JSON and that the content length is the length of that JSON string and then all uh, header f headers are name value pairs but the the values are always strings so this size comes back as uh, you know it's a stood size t so it's like an unsigned long I have to convert that to a string to stick it as the value of a header field um, this little error checking code here, we can take a look at that. Uh, get the request from the session. Now what I found a little bit confusing uh, in this API is that the session as passed into these callbacks has a request object and a response object. And you would think um, that you would do something like get the request object and then if we drill into this, the request object has on it a method called getBody. But when I did that, I was getting an empty body, and it's because I didn't... We'll see how I deal with that. Um, but it, So it was a little bit confusing um, that there were these accessors that would seem to be the thing I would want to use to get access to you know, the body of the request. Uh, for requests that take a body. Here we're doing a get verb, which so there's no body. But it didn't quite work uh, that way. And um, the documentation being a little uh, incomplete, you know, it took a while to figure out what I was doing wrong. We'll, we'll see that in a little bit. Um, so get the request off the session. From the request, I can validate that it has this path parameter. Technically, the way I configured that resource, that shouldn't ever happen, but it doesn't hurt to be paranoid in server code and always check your assumptions because um, code may evolve over time and you don't want things to crash. You want to detect errors as soon as you can and report them sensibly. So um, validate that it does have this path parameter. Then I'll get the path parameter off of um, the request and then validate that this um, 
parameter that came in is reasonable for my database and uh, a further check that the one that we're accessing in the database doesn't happen to be one that was deleted we'll, we'll see why that logic is necessary in a little bit so um, if everything was good then this function valid ID returns true otherwise uh, the, the ID is at a range we report an error message on that if we see what that looks like it means on the session that we close this session with a not acceptable status code the message that we're res reporting goes into the body of the response the type of the response body is text plain and its length is the size of that message string that we were given so if we got a valid ID and, and that'll look good then this function returns true otherwise here we had an ID but the ID is out of range so we report that error here we report that it didn't have the ID at all which we were requiring uh, and then in either of these error cases we're going to return false so if we get a true from this call to this function that means the ID is within range we can freely use it as an index into this vector we don't have to worry about going off the front or going off the end we can fetch the thing out of there we also don't need to worry about this being a stale entry in our database that got marked for deletion because we already validated that in this function as well so we can just turn that into JSON and and return it now um, when we delete something we still have to check that it's a valid ID you don't want to allow something to be deleted twice without errors you know if you delete it once that's fine um, but deleting it a second time that's an error then because you're trying to delete something that's already been deleted and now we get into this business of making sure that we are making uh, atomic changes to our database which is you know whenever you have asynchronous operations or concurrency happening I mean this is a server that can potentially be initiating multiple threads one per connection you know handling a thread handing connections uh, from a thread pool and so on and there's asynchronous network IO going on as well um, so we want to make sure that the operations we perform on our database are consistent in the face of concurrency so I've got a little global mutex on my database and I'm acquiring that in a lock before I empty out the entry in the vector remember when we looked at this little struct when it was default constructed the issue number was set to the sentinel that indicates that this is a, a deleted issue so acquire the lock null that out and then release the lock before we do any more stuff so scoping the lock here around just the operation that modifies the database to obtain maximum concurrency um, and you, we don't want to be holding that lock while we're uh, calling back into rest bed to initiate some network IO um, now for update it gets a little more interesting similar kind of error checking as we did before if this was a bad ID we just you know get right out of here this uh, valid ID function recorded the error message in the response so we don't need to do anything more if that thing said it was a bad ID but now we need to get the body of the request in an update operation you send JSON that represents the new version of the object that to be associated with this ID uh, in the body of the request so we have to read that body out it's JSON we have to turn it from JSON back into an object and then we have to validate that the object has sensible data in it before we're going to accept that uh, to modify our data in the database so the first thing we have to do is have to get the size of the body by uh, calling this get header with the content length to get get the content length the value of the content length header now what I've done is 
uh, initialized this size t to 0 here and then passed it in as the argument. Now, you might ask yourself why, you know, this, this second argument to get header is, if we, if we look at the signature, the second argument is the default value for the header if the header is not present. And you notice this is a template function whose first argument is the type that I am requesting the uh, value be converted to when the string value is fetched out and parsed out. Now, um, you might say to yourself, why didn't I just put 0 here? Well, because 0 as an integer constant is not typically unsigned. Uh, in fact, it won't be unsigned. If you go and drill into the standard, it says that literal values, they start with int and then it goes to unsigned int if, it, if it's too big for an int and if it's too big for an unsigned int, it goes to a, a long int and then if it's too, and so on. It promotes the type up starting with int. So I wanted the return type from this function to be whatever the type of size t is and this is usually uh, I mean here it's unsigned int 64 so even unsigned int isn't the right type um, and and exactly what type size t becomes is implementation defined anyway so I don't want to have to know that but if I use length here which I've initialized to 0 as my default parameter as sorry as the as the value for the default parameter then it will instantiate that template member function using the type of length as the type of the return value which is what I want I want it to return a size t so by doing that instead of putting zero here explicitly I avoid any kind of complaining from the compiler about oh you took an int and you casted it you implicitly converted it to an unsigned int that may result in some loss of precision because ints are signed and it's just it's kind of I'm not a fan of that signed unsigned conversion warning that you get from every compiler these days so this is kind of a way to guarantee that I won't get that uh, problem in this case anyway digression aside if that length came back as zero for some reason, which it shouldn't, um, then we're going to respond with a not acceptable response because we, we need uh, a body. We need some kind of non-zero JSON data. And then we're going to call this uh, fetch method on the session. Now, here's the part where I got a little bit confused um, because their documentation is more of reference and not a guide. I kind of figured it out after looking at some examples, but it wasn't initially obvious to me why I couldn't just say, instead of doing all this stuff that I'm doing here, why I couldn't just say, you know, like, you know um, the data is, uh, this is rest bed bytes, uh, why I couldn't just say request get body. I mean, I can do this. I mean, it's, it's syntactically valid no squiggles the problem is if I do this this when, whenever I did this the body would always come back as empty and I started initially suspecting my little uh, rest API testing extension that I have on Chrome which we'll look at in a second when we run this thing I was suspecting like is it somehow not constructing the body of my request properly and, and no I'm just not using this library correctly is what the problem was you have to call fetch and it makes sense in hindsight but it was a little confusing to me at first even though that initial example we looked at used fetch it wasn't you know I, I looked at that initial example you know and then time passed and then I was here to this point where I was trying to get the body out of the request and I was thinking like, oh, well, uh, there's a get body method on the request. I can just use that. And it, turn, it turns out that doesn't return any useful data until you've fetched it, which makes sense in hindsight again. But it was just a little uh, confusing at first. At any rate, so we need to fetch the data because it may not have arrived across the network connection yet. So 
the amount of data we're going to read is the entirety of the body based on the content length. And then we're going to supply a callback. And this callback is executed asynchronously. So you might think uh, that you would do something like this. You say like std string json and then have this callback just uh, take a reference to let's take this and comment it out briefly. You might say uh, I'll just take a reference to my json. I'll take a session and the buffer of data and I'll just say that JSON equals uh, you know just do something like that um, and did I do that oh this has to be cast You know, you might think, why, why can't I just do that? Well, the problem is that because this is an asynchronous callback, even though you're um, capturing a reference to this local variable, by the time, you know, the, what's going to happen is this fetch call is going to return immediately, and then we're going to immediately return from this function, and now this local variable doesn't exist anymore because you just deconstructed it on the stack. Now you have this callback that has a reference to a local that doesn't exist. And, um, you know, you might try to do something, you know, do something with, uh, do something with this JSON string. But when you get here, like, the string's going to be empty because this callback hasn't been, it's been, like, kind of recorded somewhere, but it hasn't actually executed. So, again, just kind of, if you're an old hat at asynchronous programming, this stuff is not new to you, but if, if you're coming to this thing for the first time, what you have to do is put all the entirety of the processing in this callback. That you can't, is, you know, this, is gonna, this callback is going to execute at some unspecified time in the future. Now, I'm, uh, you still have this possible problem of capturing variables that might have died while well, I'm capturing this local variable ID by value and it's just a std size t so that's fine it's getting a copy of that std size t in the captured lambda and I'm capturing the database reference um, I'm, I'm capturing the database by reference and that's passed in and the database lifetime if we look back here the lifetime of the database is congruent with the lifetime of the service. So the database never disappears before the service disappears. So this was by value and the lifetime of this reference is longer than the life of the service. So we're we're okay. We're not having that problem of capturing things into our lambda that have bad lifetimes relative to the lifetime of the code that's running in the lambda. So we get past this byte buffer. We can extract the JSON string out of that. We can reconstitute an object from that string. Then we can do a little bit of validation. So when we just converted it from JSON, all that was checked was that the name value pairs matched up, that there were values, it was properly structured JSON. But the JSON code didn't validate that, you know, the string values were non-empty, for instance, or that the integer specifying the issue number made sense. So we do that validation here. If any of those conditions fail, and, you know, technically, if you're into comic books, you might realize, hey, sometimes they don't list the name of the person who did the lettering or the person who did the coloring. But for simplifying uh, our situation here, we're just going to assume that they all have to be non-empty. The issue number has to be positive and not zero. If any of those conditions fail, we will uh, record a not acceptable response on the session, and then we're done. Otherwise, again, we're going to modify the database, so uh, scope the lock to the smallest scenario that we can.
and we're going to update the database with the new deserialized comic instance that we got from our JSON and then we will um, we, we don't have anything interesting to report back so we just report back an OK status code uh, that was for the delete case and the last case to look at is the create case and here uh, what there's different ways you can do this there's no hard and fast rule for rest API design about you know how your create requests should be structured um, they're definitely not going to be associated with an ID because an ID references an existing resource and we're creating a new resource but whether it's you know slash comic or you could have it be you know create comic or it could be new comic or you know in my case I just I just make it so that if you post without you if you send a request to either with using either the put or the post verb to a resource that does not have a trailing ID then I'm assuming that you what you want to do is create so I have this create comic function it's very similar to the update gonna do exactly the same thing there's just no ID this time just captured a reference to the database in this callback we're going to get the JSON from the body do some valid oops do some uh, validation on that deserialized object and if everything was okay this time instead of replacing an existing object in the vector based on its ID we're just going to append it to the end using pushback now I mentioned that you want to let's see if I can get it here was a mistake let's do that again okay new window okay so I have this um, I'm using this uh, rest API tester extension for Google Chrome it's free they have a pay version but I haven't needed the paid version um, so I have if we run our little server here let's go back over here to Visual Studio I made some edits, so we'll probably need to build. I'm just drag this over here so you can see it. So, because um, I've got a logger attached, you see that it, you know service accepting HTTP connections at localhost port 80, and it's published a route on slash comic and another one on slash comic slash something with an ID consisting of numbers. So we go back over here to our little tester. If I so here, uh, localhost. Let's see if we can make this a little bigger. There we go. Uh, localhost port 80. The path portion of the URI is slash comic slash zero. So this is my ID, my path parameter. I'm using the get method or HTTP verb of get. And if I send that here is the response that came back it came back with JSON and here's my little JSON serialized version of the object if I look at ID 1 and send that here's the second little comic issue that I've pre-populated my database with if I look at ID 2 or 3 the ID is out of range because I haven't added anything to the database for those IDs if I uh, so that's your read operation now here for the update operation the verb is put we're gonna update ID 0 and here's the JSON data so if we look at what ID 0 was before we'll send that again just so we can see that it is fantastic Four number one is currently ID 0 and on this I'm going to change it to Incredible Hulk number 1 so if I send that request that succeeded 
with no it didn't it didn't give me any message other than the status code to tell me that it was successful and now if I go back and get it uh, ID 0 again it was Fantastic Four number 1 if I send that now it's Incredible Hulk number 1 and you might have noticed that some of these credits also changed I can also do a delete operation so I'm using the delete verb and I'm going to delete ID 1 so if I send that response was 200 OK if I go back and try to get ID 1 now I should get a bad ID message which I do because in my little my database is just a stood vector and I don't want when I delete something I don't want all the IDs to shift and I'm using the IDs as indices into my vector so that's why I had that little magic sentinel to indicate that an entry in the vector has been deleted uh, I can let's go the, the first I had if we remember my code here I had two different ways you could create um, and why do I have two different ways well you know there's no need to have two different ways but um, there just isn't a uniform consensus on whether you put to uh, a resource or post to a resource in order to do the create operation um, both are considered acceptable so I enabled both uh, you know because why not you know if you're used to doing it one way or maybe you have a client framework that only does post and it doesn't do put or maybe it only does put and it doesn't do post there's a lot of variation out there in webland so it doesn't hurt to support both so if we go back over here to our tester this first way of creating one does a, with a put so here's the uh, body of what I'm gonna put so I can send that and now it just gave back response code 200 OK a more sophisticated thing would be to not only report back the success of the operation but in the body return JSON that indicates the URL of the newly created resource see right now I created this resource but I don't have any idea what its ID is um, I happen to know it's going to be ID 2 which previously was a bad ID but since we just created one there it is for ID 2 but a better thing would have been to have it so that when you create the body of the response should contain some indication of the ID of the newly created resource uh, if I ha if uh, I want to create with post it's similar this time I'm creating amazing spider-man number one if I send that again I, again I get response okay I go back over here and if I request that ID 3 it's amazing spider-man number one so using one of these uh, little Chrome extensions this is not the only one there are others I've used others in the past this one you know I described this one because it was like lots of downloads and highly rated and it was free but it's going to make your life much much easier to be able to test a, your rest API using this kind of a, a extension to Chrome um, if we look at you know when we do an update I mean I've put in the text here as JSON you might have noticed this little JSON was highlighted down here I could have put it in as XML and it would understand how to you know format XML tags for my junk but I could also do um, content from a file so obviously typing in text isn't going to work if I'm trying to test an API endpoint that takes a binary blob like a JPEG file or something like that I'm up doing some kind of file upload that's not going to work typing in text right I need to attach some kind of file payload there's also um, form uh, for initially a lot of this stuff uh, with um, resource endpoints in HTTP originated around uh, form submission 
and there's this um, data type, you know, called, you know, I think it's like X, you know, HTML URL form encoded or something like that. So that's the, the, the form uh, option. And, and that's to match interactive forms that are filled out by a user, you know, typing in text into text fields and so on, picking choices from menus and so on. Um, it can still be useful to do the, the form submit version, but usually I think for a, a modern REST API that's designed to be used from a piece of code and not from an interactive user, it's more likely it's either going to be text, some kind of JSON representation, or it's going to be uh, encoding from a file. But this lets you test the various operations and endpoints that you have on your service. So, to recap, in RESTbed, you instantiate a service, configure resources that are published against URI patterns that can include path parameters. After you configure the resources, you um, start the service with um, some custom settings. In my case, the only setting that I have here, we didn't look at it yet, but I was using that connection close and that's matches the fact that on all of my responses I am closing the session when I give the response if I was coding a keep alive oriented server then uh, I wouldn't have this header set to close I'd have it set to keep alive and instead of doing a close calling the close method on the session I'd be calling yield so yield is similar to close but it's how you provide data and an HTTP response but keep the connection open to allow more requests to come in on that connection so overall I'd say this library is is good it I mean things worked the documentation is acceptable but not awesome uh, it could use a little bit of improvement it could use some more um, of a programming guide perspective uh, and I didn't show it to you here but um, here's all their little examples where I went through and uh, took all their markdown files and turned them into actual code that I could try out um, and one other wrinkle that came up was when I was using this from VC package um, if you've used VC package before you may notice that when you go through the VC package install process and it downloads the packages and builds them it may tell you um, oh uh, to use this package do find package rapid JSON you know config required this part is directly copied and pasted from the VC package build output when it tells you how to use this package that you've consumed and it also tells you what is the name of the imported target that you should link against in order to get include paths configured correctly library search paths configured correctly and the appropriate uh, link line set up now for RESTbed, it didn't output any of that. And what that means is that it downloaded, configured, and built RESTbed, but RESTbed didn't have any find module support built in. So I had to write one. It's not particularly difficult. Uh, in our previous discussions of CMake, we've discussed how to do that. Uh, so that's why I have this uh, appending the local CMake directory to my CMake module path so that this find package restbed will work. If we take a look at that, it's your basic standard find the library. And I looked in the build directory that VC package created and the name of the library was restbed shared. So that's the library I'm looking for. And then the I search for a file which is the include file, which for them is just restbed with no .h. And then the rest of this is just boilerplate 
saying, uh, you know, if either of those two things couldn't be found, then, it, you know, it's an it's uh, an error message. And if we found them, then I can go ahead and, excuse me, I can create a imported target for this shared library and set the appropriate properties on it so that in my program here when I link against it the include directory will be set up so that my client code can find the rest bed header and the link library location will be set correctly and so on so all that stuff set up so there it, it didn't come with a find module for rest bed so if you're trying this on your own and you're like hey uh, I configured it with VC package but it didn't tell me how to find rest bed um, that's why so once I did that then uh, except for a few examples uh, the compression library has an additional dependency on zlib so I didn't feel like figuring that out uh, PAM authentication is a Unix thing so that's not going to work on Windows um, there was something up with the session manager sample it didn't build right away so I just commented it out syslog logging is a Unix thing so again that's not going to work on Windows uh, and there was some issue with their WebSocket example and then since I was going to use WebSockets I didn't bother figuring it out so I just commented that one out as well but otherwise all their samples at least they build I didn't run all of them I ran a couple of them that uh, were useful to helping me understand this library this is again why I think their examples should be buildable code in their repo that gets tested on continuous integration testing they do testing on Windows and on Unix so had they done that probably they would have noticed that some of these samples aren't building quite out of the box some of these examples rather is what they call them so minor shortcomings on the documentation minor shortcomings on having buildable examples out of the box but not and no uh, find module for their library but these are all minor things that are easily gotten around um, and you know as always the real documentation is always the source code and not things coming from comments whether it's doxygen or you know this manually created documentation that they have and what I was mentioning before is they have that top level header that really just includes all these other headers um, so if for some reason including the whole world is you know hurting your compile times you could include one of these you know just the the few headers that you needed instead of everything oh here's that string we saw there was missing documentation so they have a header so they do have a string class it just wasn't in their documentation so oh this is a uh, just providing a bunch of helpers oh look here's one I could have used it takes the bytes and turns it into a stood string I could have used that instead of doing it myself I wonder what they doesn't know how to find the implementation um, eh, so looks like again just the downside of manually written documentation as far as their like coding standard goes I don't have to adhere to it myself so it, it doesn't bother me in that regard but I'm not a fan of you know calling out all these commented sections that you know are empty I, I find that to be just personally I just find that to be noise uh, extraneous noise when reading a header file but they describe that that's the way they do things in their coding standards document so that's the way you should expect things to look so that is it not a bad little library um, its uh, underlying network transport is boost ASIO asynchronous IO so uh, it's using asynchronous network I.O. underneath everything. Um, that's a pretty good performing network stack. Uh, 
and its full featured network stack. I didn't find any need to have to dip down into boost ASIO in order to do anything. I think they provided sufficient abstractions on top to let you do advanced things without having to dip into that transport library. But if you uh, step through the implementation in order to understand things, you will see it go into that boost ASIO code. Um, looks pretty full featured. Minor quibbles on the documentation and their examples, but otherwise everything worked. Didn't have any problems doing uh, basic CRUD operations on my little sample here, so not a bad library. I think we will look at some other REST API libraries. This is certainly not the only one. And then uh, we'll be able to compare how they do things in RESTbed with how the other libraries have chosen to do things, and we'll see you know, how that compares, what pros and cons there are between these different libraries. Um, if there's any questions, you can either use uh, chat or audio before we wrap up. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so we will look at another topic, probably another REST API library next month. Thanks for joining.